This is All India Radio. In the program Spotlight, now we bring you a discussion on gearing up for Manipur Assembly election. The participants are senior journalists Pradeep Panjoban and K. V. Prasad. Elections to Manipur Assembly will be held on 27th of February and 3rd of March. And by 10th of March, we will know a new government will be in place. Primarily, the Bharti Janata Party is running the government now under Mr. Biren Singh. And the party obviously would like to do its best to see its retain power, much against the determined push by the Congress, which had a very long run in the state. Pradeep, if one were to understand the broad contours as the elections look like a bipolar race, but then we know there are many other parties who would be trying to test their electoral fortunes. Could you give a broad picture as it looks now? There are two main players, the BJP and the Congress, but there are also third-party players who are actually waiting in the sidelines because as in last time, they're expecting hung assembly. If it is a hung assembly, they'll have a field, be able to bargain, to join whichever party is going to form the next government. And in the last election, we saw this. The BJP won 21 and the Congress won 28 in a house of 60. So Congress was just three short of majority and the BJP had to pull in 10 more. And the chance was given to BJP, so they had to pull in the other parties by giving them ministership. And the ceiling of the cabinet size in Manipur is 12, including CM. So what happened was last time, only four seats were left for the ruling party. The rest were just distributed. Actually, the smaller parties, other than these two main players, are waiting in a sideline for such a situation so that they can actually have their share of the cake. That is generally the broad picture that we have here. There is going to be a two-way contest. But in case of a hung assembly, and there are many parties who are hoping as well as expecting it to be hung assembly so that they can bargain and join whichever is going to form the government. But if one were to look at the bigger picture that emerges from the state, because the state has its own share of issues and the government of the day has been addressing some of them, basic as we hear, infrastructure issues that affect people on a daily basis, be it roads, be it electricity and things like that. And we heard a lot of the government and the Bharat Janata Party saying a lot of things have been done in the last five years. So they kind of hope to that the people will realize the kind of work done by this government. So if one were to look at infrastructure, because that has been the bane, not just in India, but this largely in Manipur and the hill state because of the terrain. So would you be able to throw some light on that? I would say that there's been some improvement in the infrastructure, but it's not very substantial kind of a jump from what was there before this government. So it's just a progressive kind of a improvement. So I don't know if the people are actually going to say that this is the work of the ruling party as such, or whether they're going to just put, put that as a, on a neutral scale and say that this would have happened in any case. As I said, there's no quantum jump as such. So I think the people are going to judge, but the judgment also is going to be influenced by the fact that the BJP is the ruling party in the center as well. So they may be weighted towards the BJP because now here there's the impression that if you're close to the party in power at the center, then you are better off. That kind of a psychology is very much there amongst the voters as well as the MLAs. So that's, uh, that's basically the equation. But as for the infrastructure, I, I think it has improved a bit, but it's not a quantum leap as such. There are areas where things are improving and there are other areas where it's stagnating as well. So I think it's not going to be such a cider as such in this election. And uh, there will be other issues that come into the picture. If we were to look at other issues that do we hear from time to time, but of course one of the areas has been of concern has been insurgency and of course the ongoing talks of on the Naga peace because these are two issues which remain on the front burner at many times and go on the back burner. So if we were to look at insurgency, which of late we remember there have been violent incidents, including the November attack, which had a lot of resonance. So how do you see that playing out? Insurgency has been an, in a low key for the past couple of years. And it doesn't mean that the issues that raise insurgency in the first place have, have all been solved. So I think although there's been less activities of the insurgents, there are not so many groups. There are some groups who are doing to, into peace talks, but those groups which have refused all this while are still refusing to come to the peace with the negotiating table. So the fact is that although there is a calm, I think this is a an easy kind of calm, that this insurgency can come up again. So that kind of feeling is there. And as we saw that, with the, that ambush, that ambush, I think, was just another one of those messages from the insurgents that they should not be forgotten, that they're still around. I don't think it's going to be a consistent kind of a campaign. That can come about, then I don't think that was part of that. It was just one of those opportunistic kind of an ambush to show the people or to, or to remind the people they're 
still around. There are people as well as the government that they're still around. You better take it seriously. That's the kind of message I think that was being sent, but not so much as a consistent kind of a campaign of violence, which is why you have one other blue moon and then again quiet. If one were to look at the large demographic thing and what one understands is, I mean, apart from the rural areas, it's a semi-urban kind of a population mix. And if you look at the Imphal Valley in particular, and of course the hills around, so there is a demographic difference. So how would you see that playing out in terms of the electoral politics? Because as I said, if that is matched with work done on the ground and also the aspirations of people, people of Manipur would like to be as much as part of the mainstream and have the benefits as the country makes a march or progress towards development. Manipur ethnically is very divided, as you have also said. And this division is at many different levels. We have the Vale hills and the valley. And within the hills, there are divisions between the different tribes, between the different groups of tribes first, and then the tribes themselves, tribe units. So you will have the Nagas and the Cookies there in the hills. But uh, it's not a homogeneous kind of thing even within those groups. So these divisions are quite deep. And which is also why people are predicting this hung assembly, that you have two parties pushing for, I mean, two different agendas. But there are so many other parties falling out of that vision, which is why there will be people voting for neither of the parties, which is also, again, the reason why the likelihood of a hung assembly is always strong in every election. But the electorate here is quite small. We have, this time, it has increased, but then it is 20.34 lakhs. And that, if you divide it into 60, it comes to about 33,000 per constituency. And that is a very small electorate. And the margins of winning can be very, very small. It can come down to even hundreds. And in that kind of a situation, you have these kind of divisions in the society. It all normally results in that fracture kind of a verdict, which is why it can happen. Somebody can have the majority. But it is usually always at the anticipation is more for the hung kind of a verdict, division within Manipur. If you were to look at some of the other issues that you think would play a role across the state of Manipur or across different pockets, depending on the kind of geographical mix and match and also the aspiration of the people of different districts and different tribes, would you be able to pinpoint a few of them? As you rightly said, one is that insurgency amongst the Nagas, there is a peace talk going on. If that comes about, then it's going to win over some section of the population. But as some section of the population is one or others are going to be alienated, that kind of thing is there. But beyond that, the other issues, I think the unemployment thing is quite high here. You know, that, and also, it has come to such a state that you know, people think employment means only government employment. Because the private enterprises are now coming up a bit, but then it's not so much job giver. And also the jobs there are not so attractive. So people are always looking for government jobs. There will be so many people who are employed in some way. You can be, say, a motor mechanic or something, but you'll also be angling for a government job because, you know, education is, it has reached everywhere, although the quality of that education is not so good. So you have a BA degree and then you're a motor mechanic. So you're always angling for a government job. So the unemployment thing is quite high. And the perception is such that you are always unemployed. So the unemployed kind of an attitude and also the government is a giver of employment, that kind of expectation is there. So if the government is able to address this issue effectively or another party is able to come up with a solution which will be seen as viable, I think those will matter. In the hills, for instance, you are poor, you don't have any income, you have the jungle to depend on, you have so much resources from the jungle, you can hunt or you can gather fruits there and things like that. So it's a different kind of poverty. People are poor, although not nutritionally, they are not so bad. Monetarily, they are poor. So that addressing will also have to be done. And these will make the difference how the parties project themselves as capable of handling this, the unemployment and poverty issues. You had mentioned about different tribes and living across in different parts of the state. Uh, but recently we read reports about the possibility of another tribe, another dominant community seeking a tribal status. Do you think that's something which can figure on the election agenda? Actually, Maiti, they live in the valley. You know, they are also, again, there's some, so many people asking for that tribal status. But there are also others within the same community who say that better off without being a tribal. And the thing is that they form about, say, 55 to 60 percent of the population. And what's happening is because of that, the reservation is there in the state. And the normal state government reservation for the tribals is 
31%, and we have 2% for the SCs. So the general population are actually feeling insecure, and they also want to be part of that thing. And also land protection, the tribal lands are protected, so nobody can go and sell there, but everybody can come and sell in the, in the valley area, which, which is their homeland. So that kind of insecurity is there. So that should, in the way that the parties address this issue creatively, I mean, without actually just falling into line with those demanding it, but if they are managed to, say, address some of the problems they are flagging without or without having to, you can but then you don't have to. If you address it creatively, take care of those issues, those insecurities in many different ways. I think those will matter. But as you said, this will have some say in the way some people are good section of the And I think as the election approaches and now that the dates are announced and very soon the notification process also begins and soon parties will come out with their manifestos, obviously which will contain a lot of promises that they're going to make and try and address many concerns uh, of the people, both uh, which are applicable across the state and also specific uh, groups which have competing demands. I think they have not given an inkling of what this, these manifestos are going to look like. And partly because of that dilemma of coming out with something which is applicable to all parts of the state. It's just a divided state. You say one thing and then that's going to offend some others. So I think they will have to be walking the tightrope and the manifestos will look like this. You address things like poverty or employment, that's going to apply to everybody. So they will try to go for that. And then if you say peace talks, then who's peace talks? That Those kind of questions will come up. So they will save it, but then probably in a little ambiguous way that it can mean everything, that that will leave room for interpretation. But the solid ones will be things like employment and poverty uplift and introduction of industries and things like that, which will address these two problems. I think those will be what the parties will be looking for, because I don't think they will be wanting to actually rub any party, any any other groups uh, the wrong way. And Manipur has a large contribution in sports and sporting uh, history of this country. The decision to set up the sports university in Manipur, how do you think that having a resonance among the younger voters of Manipur in particular? I think all the parties would actually be thinking of that because uh, there's a young population here and also mentioned earlier unemployment, this uh, sense of frustration is quite high. And people are actually, uh, sports has been a an outlet for the youth here, which is why the, the, the place is good in sports. There's a kind of, almost a desperate kind of thing or, or a challenge that you can make it. You know, the government has an employment capacity of about, say, 70,000, and the population is about 30 lakhs now. And so great section of the youth know that they have to find some, some other way of actually making it. And sports has been one of those huge outlets. So I think parties must also be realizing it that they have to address this section of the population. Pradeep, you mentioned of, uh, some of the smaller parties, and if one just to jog memory back, we go back to the last election. We had NPP, the National People's Party, winning four seats and joining the government. Of course, somewhere in 2020, the Biren Singh government came into some kind of turbulence. They managed to manage the contradictions and then move forward. And you said probably a hung house would result in uh, many such aspirational parties having a say in the larger scheme of things. As I said, that's going to be a factor in a sense that in the last uh, government formation especially, the single largest party was not given the first opportunity. They would have just managed with three from outside support. But the next largest party, the BJP, they had 21, they had to bring in 10, and they brought in the NPP, right? They had four MLAs and all four of given ministers. And then we have the NPF, Naga People's Front, they had four MLAs, they were two of them ministership one from a small party and the other one from the Congress. And that too, he was disqualified later on, but for almost three years, he's carried on. That's, the smaller parties were given incentives that he, it's better for you to be there if you're a first-timer, for instance. You join the bigger party, you're just going to be on the sideline. Even if you win, there's less likelihood of you becoming a minister because there'll be party followers and people who have been there in the party for a long time, they would be given the first preference. But if you go to a third party, smaller party, and if there's a hung assembly, then you can bargain. Even if you're first timer in the assembly, you can bargain and become a minister. That kind of negative kind of incentive has been given. So I think parties like the NPP, they feel that they will be able to win more this time. Partly because many of the winnable candidates, instead of opting for the bigger parties, they're opting for the smaller ones. If they were to join the bigger parties, you know, they win, there's less likelihood of them becoming ministers. But if you join the smaller parties, then you'll have that bargaining power if there is a hung assembly. And they're expecting a hung assembly. Pradeep, thank you for being here. You were listening to a discussion on gearing up for Manipur Assembly election.
The participants were senior journalists Pradeep Phandroban and KV Prasad. This program was produced and presented by the News Services Division of All India Radio. You can listen to it on our mobile app News on AIR. This program is also available on our YouTube channel News on AIR Official. You may email your opinion about this program at airnsdtalks@gmail.com. At